supporters of MHS. I welcome you all to late Vice Admiral M. P. Avdi commemorative conversations. We are gathered today to commemorate the birth anniversary of a modern naval legend of India, late Vice Admiral M. P. Avdi. On this beautiful monsoon evening, along with commemorating the memory of the founder of MHS, we celebrate India's rich lineage of maritime heroes. Indian historical narratives celebrate heroes from all spheres religious thought, politics, philosophy, sports, education, science, and so on. But our maritime heroes are often overlooked. Today, we get to know our naval heroes who controlled and influenced the maritime landscape of India. But before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to brief you about the Maritime History Society. MHS is an academic initiative of the Western Naval Command focusing on the maritime research. The Maritime History Society came into being on 12th of May 1978 to promote the study of India's maritime history. It was founded by the late Vice Admiral M. P. Avdi to promote awareness of India's rich maritime history amongst the young naval officers and the public at large. MHS in its constant endeavours aims to promote outreach activities through its educational programmes and seeks to evolve into a body of eminence in the field of maritime history. MHS conducts monsoon series lectures every year during the monsoon months. This series was renamed Monsoon Musings based on an earlier compilation done by the previous curator, Commander Mohan Narayan. This year, given the pandemic and the restrictions on socializing, Maritime History Society has taken a digital step and shifted all its events to an online format, exploring its digital and creative skills. As an online event, this fourth monsoon musings will see the in-house team of MHS present a lineage of Indian maritime heroes of the past and the present in the form of an audio-visual presentation. Today's opening address will be delivered by our chairman, Vice Admiral R.B. Pandit. A recipient of Ati Vishista Seva Medal, Vice Admiral R.B. Pandit has held numerous operational as well as staff appointments. He is an anti-submarine war specialist. Vice Admiral Pandit has commanded the Western Fleet and has served as the Commandant of Indian Naval Academy before taking over as the Chief of Staff Western Naval Command. He is also the Chairman of Maritime History Society. We look forward to listening to you, sir. Over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, and all those of you who have signed up for this commemorative conversation on the Maritime Heroes of India, in honour of Vice Admiral Manohar Avti, a doyen of modern-day India's tryst with matters maritime, and the founder of the Maritime History Society. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you all. Today, the 7th of September is a significant day, for it is the birth anniversary of Admiral Auti. I am glad the MHS has chosen to commemorate the occasion with a conversation on India's maritime legacy and the extraordinary voyages that mark the pages of our history. This is a most appropriate theme not only to acknowledge Admiral Auti's love for the oceans, but to also dust out and celebrate the maritime heroes that India has produced over the ages. As a nation, our collective sea blindness has kept us from fully recognizing the significance of the seas and of sea power in shaping of our nation. It has also kept us from acknowledging the immense contribution of those who, despite the constraints and even shackles that this sea blindness has imposed, have gone out on the limb to secure and advance our interests in the maritime domain. 
if we are to prepare and equip ourselves to create an impact on the emerging world order we need to recognize that the contemporary geopolitical situation is greatly influenced by happenings on the oceans of the world the turbulence in the geopolitical arena can be likened to the mythological samudra manthan that throws up opportunities it will be up to us individually and collectively to capitalize on these our maritime legacy modest in some ways and yet monumental in others will illuminate the course that we will need to steer today's conversation should give us hope and remind us that there have been many occasions when our forebears have risen to similar challenges and through their endeavors have set a solid foundation for the edifice of a nation to be built on some of them built strong navies and fought on the seas others were itinerant explorers and yet others have established glorious shipbuilding traditions each in his own way has been a hero a word about the young research team at the maritime history society i do believe that the pull of the seas has awakened the spirit of inquiry in them and they have another proud nuggets to recall inspiring maritime heroes of india and their extraordinary voyages do hear these accounts and you will be inspired to know more to cite just one example you will find it most interesting to understand why the regimental insignia of the punjab regiment is a naval galley with a bank of oars probably the only infantry regiment to have such a insignia i similarly look forward to hearing sir robin knox johnston a sailing legend who made history by becoming the first man to sail solo and non stop around the globe some nuggets of history here sir robin mentored commander dilip donde a very own voyager extraordinaire who also circumnavigated the globe solo and unassisted in a voyage called sagar parikrama the brain child of admiral outi Incidentally the yacht used by Sir Robin in his seminal voyage was built in Bombay With these words I shall give way to the Maritime History Society to take forward this edition of the Monsoon Musings and I wish that all the connoisseurs listening in are smitten by the romance of the seas Thank you Thank you sir we shall now sail through times and revisit our maritime landscape discussing and discovering a rich melange of india's maritime heroes good evening everybody i welcome all to the maritime history society's celebration of the monsoon through this fourth monsoon musings today 7th of September is a special occasion to commemorate a leading maritime legend late vice admiral mp avti on his birth anniversary let's remember a few maritime legends and heroes of india the sea is a vast medium of opportunities and collaborations sailing on the waves of time our country has seen many who have left an impressive wake Mostly unsung our naval heroes are those who have significantly influenced the course of history in the past and continue to do so even today These maritime heroes are figures that are marked apart for their ideas thoughts actions and contributions The maritime medium covers the oceanic space on the three sides of our country it is an aspect that is not realized from the land today maritime history society celebrates the indian maritime heroes figures who crossed the ocean with a sense of mission this evening we go back in time to the ancient and the early medieval history to explore our maritime historical landscape and sail forward towards our modern naval legends to uncover a lineage of heroes we don't normally see so let the voyage begin i am denard de souza i'm a research associate at the maritime history society 
The first maritime hero we could talk about is Pulakeshi II. He was the Chalukyan emperor who ruled most of southern and central India from 610 to 642 CE. During this time period, the Arabs were on an expansionist spree. Under the Rashidun Caliphate, the Arabs were intent on making inroads into India via the sea route. They made three attempts at invasion by the sea. The first attempt at laying siege on Indian soil was in the year 637 CE. A naval expedition was sent to attack the port of Thana, which was then under the control of the Kalyani Chalukyas. The Arabs faced a crushing defeat at the hands of Emperor Pulakeshin's naval force. But tenacious as the Arabs were under the aegis of the Caliph Omar, they sent two more naval expeditions against India in a short span of five years. This time, the Arab naval fleet attacked Baroch in Gujarat and Port Tabel in Sindh. No one knows what happened next, but after these three attacks, the Arab caliphs completely abandoned the naval conquest. These naval raids may not have yielded any success to the Arabs and therefore it must have felt sensible to jettison naval raids from their war strategy. A century later though, the Arabs once again attempted to attack the Chalukyas in 737. But this time it was via the land route at a place close to the port town of Navasarika. The Arabs were defeated again at the hands of the Emperor Pulakeshin's descendant. His name was Pulakeshin of Navasarika. He was bestowed with the title Avani Janashre, which meant the protector of the world's people by the Emperor Vikramaditya II for having crushed the Arab invasion once again. The Arabs continued to launch naval raids under the Umayyads, who were successors of the Rashidun Caliphate. They engaged the Saindavas of Saurashtra in a naval battle twice once in the reign of Pusha Deva in 756 CE and then 20 years later in 776 under the reign of mm -hmm. Anguka who took the title Apara Samudradipati which meant Master of the Sea. In these battles, Indians registered a victory. As a result of this disaster, the Caliph al Mahdi gave up the project of conquering any part of India anymore. A second maritime hero is Parakesri Rajendra Chola I. He was born to the great Chola Emperor Arul Moli Varman alias Raja Raja Chola and a Chera princess named Vanavan Mahadevi. His greatest achievement was the conquest of Sri Vijaya, which according to Neil Kanta Shastri, the eminent historian of South India, was motivated by a trade blockade induced by the Sri Vijayans. But let's look at the beginning of Rajendra Chola's reign. Rajendra and his illustrious father, Raja Raja, were the two shining stars of the imperial Cholas. The duo expanded their territory from the Maldives in the west to Kadaram in the east and Ceylon in the south to the banks of the Ganga in the north. Emperor Rajendra I inherited his father's already flourishing kingdom even before he was anointed the emperor of the Chola Empire in 1014 CE. He was made the co-regent with his father Raja Raja in the renal year 1012 CE. During Raja Raja's reign, the Chola Navy was already a formidable force to deal with. It was instrumental in capturing the 12,000 islands, that is the Maldives, in the, reign, in the 29th renal year of the emperor and later in laying siege on Anuradhapura in 992-93 CE. Raja Raja was aware of the importance of a naval force in the war apparatus of a kingdom. According to Neil Kanta Shastri, his conquest of Kandalur Saleh and William was with the intent of sterilizing the power of the Cheras. The Cheras were one of the arch rivals of the Cholas and had a significant maritime presence in the Western Indian Ocean region. Rajendra Chola had the fortune of inheriting a robust naval force from his father. It was this naval apparatus that was instrumental in maintaining the Chola monopoly in the Indian Ocean region. During this era, the Cholas were the most powerful Indian kingdom in Asia and they made their presence felt in the maritime domain. Naval conquest was not new to Rajendra. 
he had used it even more effectively to conquer larger territories. Before he conquered Sri Vijaya in 1025, he reconquered Sri Lanka for the Cholas in 1017 CE. During the reign of his father, the island was partially conquered, but Rajendra brought the entire island under his sway. The question that lingers in the minds of scholars is what exactly triggered this invasion? It is important to note that the Sri Vijayan king had sound diplomatic relationship with the Cholas during the reign of Raja Raja. The Sri Vijayan king Sri Mara Vijayatunga, with the patronage of Raja Raja, built a large Buddhist monastery named the Chudamani Vihara. The upkeep of this monastery was ensured by a grant of a village named Ane Mangalam by Raja Raja. The grant was renewed by Rajendra after his father's death. So what exactly caused the rift? Some are of the opinion that the invasion of Kadaram was instigated by the trade blockages imposed by the Sri Vijayans, as they did to the jewel merchants, who were allowed passage after levying 20,000 dinars, while others are of the opinion that it was an imperialist conquest, similar to those expedited on Maldives and Sri Lanka. My take is that it was instigated by the trade blockages imposed by the Sri Vijayans and to instill the Chola hegemony on the eastward maritime trade. There is an interesting inscription from the Tanjore temple which gives a detailed account of this invasion of Kadaram. It is thanks to such records that we get a glimpse into ancient Indian maritime heroes. Thank you. My name is Aishwara Devasthari and I am a project research associate at Maritime History Society. The third of our maritime heroes is not just one person but four of them together known as the Kunjali Marakkars. Since the ancient times Malabar, the ancient name of Kerala had trade relations with faraway lands like Arabia, Rome and China. Kollam, Kodangallur and Kozikode were the major trading ports which led to a tough competition. Most of us in India know about Vasco da Gama, but very few amongst us know about the history of Kunjali Marakkars or Kunhali Marakkars who are credited to organize the first naval defense on Indian coast. Long time ago, Zamorins were the rulers of Kozikode and were one of the most talked about, powerful and wealthy and strong kingdoms in India. This was possible because of the cordial relations the Arabs, Chinese and Roman traders had with the Malabar region for centuries. Though Zamorins followed Hinduism, they were tolerant of all religious ideas and business relations. The story got twist with the arrival of Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama in 1497. Both the Zamorin and Vasco da Gama rubbed each other the wrong way and friendly trade talks did not happen. Though the Gama returned to Lisbon, he came back to Kozikode again in 1503 with a strong intention to spread Christianity and monopolize spice trade. Steadily, the Portuguese began to dictate terms of trade to evict Arab traders from the Malabar region. They had the audacity to mandate that any ship carrying profitable goods, even if it is of Indian origin, had to have a pass from Portuguese, else they were confiscated. Now, this was naturally not acceptable to Zamorins and thus lot of conflicts were created and war situations were created. There were four Kunjali Marakkars who commanded the Zamorins Armada between 1500 and 1600 century, common era, and played a big role in keeping indigenous rule in safe hands. They were Kuti Ali Marakkar, son of Kuti Ali Marakkar, Pathu Marakkar and Muhammad Marakkar. Kunjali Marakkar I defeated the Portuguese army and inflicted heavy casualties on them. Mendes, the commander of Portuguese, retaliated by raiding Ponnani, the base of the Marakkas, and destroyed several ships. In successive battles, the Portuguese were defeated at Pantaliani and Kollam, besides the fort at Kallai, forcing the Portuguese to leave the fort. Kunjali Marakkas then shifted their base to Puttupannam, near Vadakara. The son of Kuti Ali Marakkar took over as Kunhali Marakkar II. He waged guerrilla warfare techniques against the Portuguese and caused them severe losses. His naval ships struck terror in the minds of invading colonialists. 
Finally, the Portuguese expressed willingness to negotiate with the Zamorin. In 1540, the Portuguese signed a treaty with Zamorin to re-establish the trade. But once they regained the strength, they reneged on the treaty and declared war against the Zamorin. In the battle that followed, the Portuguese with their superior firepower defeated the combined onslaught of the Zamorin and Kunjali Marakkar at Edepalli. The Zamorin had to allow the foreigners to build a fort at Chaliam. In 1569, Kunjali Marakkar III took charge. Within two years, he re-established himself as a very efficient and powerful commander. He attacked the fort at Chaliam, destroyed the Portuguese armory, and struck terror in their minds. The third Kunjali Marakkar planned and erected the fort at Eringal near Watakara. The Zamorin permitted him to erect a fort, which he saw in his strategic interests. The fort area is now known as Kotakkal, where the naval commander established officers' quarters, mosques, business centers, and residential areas around the fort. A full-fledged naval base was put into place. The Portuguese once again tried to build their fort at Punani. But Kunjali Marakkar's quick and devastating style of attack frustrated them, and Portuguese had to surrender. However, they employed agent provocateurs to spread false information and scandal against the Kunjali Marakkar's in order to ruin the relationship between Zamorin. Eventually, their canard led to decline of the Marakkar's. Kunjali Marakkar IV came to power in 1595. He abrogated the treaty of surrender of the Portuguese and declared war. The Zamorin sided with the Portuguese and Marakkar fought the combined forces of the Zamorin and Portuguese at Eringal in 1599. The Marakkar lost the battle and was forced to sign treaty with the Portuguese. Though he signed a treaty in order to buy peace, the Portuguese reneged and cheated them and captured him through a treachery and deceit. He was tortured and eventually killed, and his body ripped apart, denying him the honor due to proud and patriotic warrior. The Zamorin was shocked to hear the news. He felt guilty over his role in this cruel act. He decided to wipe out the Portuguese from the land. In 1604, he struck friendship with the Dutch, with sole aim to defeat the Portuguese. The Portuguese were defeated and were made to flee Kozhikode. Indeed the four Kunjali Marakkars proved to be heroes of western coast. If one is interested in tracing the maritime history or to know more about Kunjali Marakkars, one can visit the ancestral home of the Marakkars at Kottakkal which is now preserved as museum. As a tribute to these unsung legends of Indian seas, Indian Navy has erected a memorial known as Kunjali Marakkar Memorial. The world history has observed that the one who holds power over a strong navy owns the seas. I am Sabha Purkar, academic assistant at Maritime History Society, and I am going to talk about our fourth maritime hero, who is again not one but two individuals from the Kohli Patel community. Both have a remarkable contribution towards the fort of Zamjira. Patel is a title of Kshatriya Kohli caste of the Maharashtra and Karnataka. Patel means head or chief. In ancient times, the Kohli Patel was the head of villages or the police under the Deccan Sultanate and the Maratha Empire. Some of the petty Kohli rulers held the Patel title as well. Here is a story of two personalities amongst the Patels which made a small yet remarkable contribution to the coastal Maharashtra with respect to Janjira and they are Rama Patel and Layaji Patel both of them belong to different periods but through their knowledge and bravery made an influence in the Maratha history the small towns on the coast were of tremendous importance in shaping the maritime history of the western coast of india as we all know janjira was one of the small princely states on the western coast of india although it was small in size 
it left a tremendous impact on the history of Konkan region for over three centuries because of its strategic position and its widely indomitable rulers. The fort of Zanjira on the sea is the only one of its kind. A less known fact is that the present Zanjira fort was once a rocky island on which a mede court, that is a place fortified with wooden logs, was built by the fishermen as protection against the pirates. Rama Patil was the commander of these fishermen. He was admiral of Ahmednagar navy and built the Janjira with the permission of the Sultan of Ahmednagar. But later Rama Patil refused to obey the orders of the Sultan. The Kolis had built a wooden fort to fend off pirates and robbers. However, they themselves became an unruly lord after that. Rama Patil began defying orders of his sovereign. The ruler of Ahmednagar started giving a tough fight to the Nizam. As a result, the ruler of Ahmednagar appointed his new admiral, known as Piram Khan, and ordered to capture the Janjira from Ram Rao Patil. Piram Khan marched from Surat but did not dare to attack Patil. So he made plans to enter into Janjira. Piram Khan and his Osiddhi officer disguised as merchants and requested to the Patil for safekeeping their 300 large boxes containing silk and wine at their island. The request was granted. After that, Piram Khan thanked him and threw a party of alcohol. When all the soldiers and Ram Rao Patil were under the influence of alcohol, he attacked at Janjira and captured it from the Patil. Indeed, it is surprising to know that Janjira, a mesmerizing maritime monument, was identified by Rama Patil and belonged to the Sons of Soil for a long time due to the efforts of Rama Koli. Janjira is the only fort that no Maratha king could ever capture. Its ruler Siddhi used to rule and loot from the region of this fort. Multiple expeditions to conquer the Janjira fort failed over the years. In 1676, Maratha king Shivaji Maharaj sent his deputy Morupan Pingle along with a large army to conquer the fort. Morupan, a seasoned military strategist, first tried bombarding shells on the fort using small ships known as Machwa, but in vain. He then came up with a second plan to send some men in the night to the fort and install ropes for the army to follow. This mission was extremely dangerous and almost suicidal. Laya Patil, a son Koli, was invited by Shubhanji Kharade Sarnobat and Shubhanji Mohite, Havildar of Padmadurg, to enter the fleet. Morupant Peshwa had planned to scale the Janjira fort with the help of Laya Patil. Along with 8 to 10 more soldiers, Laya Patil left from Padmadurk in the dead of the night. After reaching the rear side of the Janjira fort, he and his men installed ropes and waited for the remaining army to follow. Laya Patil is thus known for doing what was thought as impossible, came very close to the capture of Janjira controlled by the Siddhis. However, assuming that the taking of Janjira was an impossible task, the Maratha army did not come and Laya Patil had to leave before anyone noticed. Although the mission was unsuccessful, his bravery did not go unnoticed. Shivaji Maharaj rewarded Laya Patil with the ship and other accolades. The enterprising Kohli chief executed his role very well. Shivaji honored the Kohli chief by bestowing on him the title of Sar Patil and the distinction of riding in a palanquin. As the Kohli chief would not accept this distinction, Shivaji had a new ship constructed and named it Palki. The well-known legacy of Paratha warriors had started from 1664 with the rise of great Shivaji Maharaj. Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj gave tremendous importance to the navy. He won Zavli in 1657 and expanded the frontier Swarajya up to the western coast of the sea. After his death, it appeared that the Maratha power might be crushed out by the Mughals. 
In between, we saw the rise of maritime heroes such as Rama Patil and Laya Patil, whose contribution left the mark on the Maratha history, as was discussed earlier. Then around 1698 rose another great naval warrior, namely Kanoji Angre. Now I am going to talk about our fifth maritime hero, the legend himself, Sarkhil Kanoji Angre. His victorious feats and daring strategies make him impossible to ignore when one speaks of the great warriors of Maharashtra. He was an ally of the Marathas as they shared the same mission of resisting the Portuguese, Dutch, the Mughals and the English. Kanoji Angre was born in Harnai in the Konkan coast of Maharashtra in 1668. Although not much is known about his early life and career, the legacy of maritime warriors was definitely pioneered by Kanoji Angre. According to the official family history, Kanoji was a Maratha Kshatriya by birth and his original surname was Sankpal. It is because of the long residence of the family in the village of Agravadi was their name changed to Angriya. Not much is known of his early life and career but he was active in Navy from 1698 to 1729. Kanuji Angre became the subedar of the Maratha Armada in the early 1698 after the demise of Siddhoji Gujar and according to his family history, Kanuji Angre was appointed after the return of Rajaram, who offered him the post of Sarkhi. The first reference to Kanuji Angre is found in the Portuguese papers where he is addressed as Subedar the Armada do Sivaji. His goal was to keep the foreign powers in control, so he improved several facilities in the naval training like discipline, efficiency, amazing skill set and proper administration of the navy. Kanoji Angre made all efforts to curb the tyranny of English, the Portuguese and the Dutch whilst never losing a single battle. He had devoted his entire life to fight against the foreign enemies. His strategies had the element of surprise and stealth which overpowered the opponent, therefore making him a valiant warrior of the navy and an immortal figure of bravado. Kanoji Angre's armada was specifically devised according to the geographical uniqueness of the Konkan coast which became a big challenge to the foreign powers. He understood the importance of the coasts, which nowadays most of us have forgotten. The East India Company, however, categorized him as a pirate because of the constant plundering of the English vessels. Although the British army was bigger in numbers, Kanoji Angri's tactics were smarter, which overpowered them. One of his well-known remarkable confrontations with the foreign powers was with the English. The English were restless since Kanoji Angre had made Kolaba his main station. The unrest increased when the island of Kanderi got passed under his command because both Kanderi and Kolaba were only a couple of miles from Bombay. Kanderi became a strategic point for Angre to keep a watch on the English vessels entering Bombay. Despite of a peace treaty established in 1713 between the two which allowed British ships to sail without being plundered, this treaty did not last for long. In 1717, a ship's success belonging to an English broker was captured by Kanhoji. Shortly, another ship was captured and he refused to return both. This infuriated the English and on 17 June 1718, the British declared war against Kanoji. Kanoji contended that the English were not entitled to exemption from the ordinary rules of passports. English loaded foreign boats with their goods and demanded the same immunity for them to which the ships of undoubted English nationality was entitled which meant financial loss for the Maratha administration. The expeditions led by English against Kanderi, Kolaba and Kheria were unsuccessful. Enemy of an enemy is a friend, so the English abided by this saying and made alliances with the Portuguese in the 1720s, 
which also failed miserably. The failed Anglo-Portuguese expedition without a doubt contributes to Kanoji Angre's prestigious career. He continued to plunder these English ships until in October 1722, Kanoji sailed from Kolaba leaving his eldest son in charge of the government. Being remarkably consistent over naval battles, he was bestowed with the title of Chief of Navy by Chhatrapati Rajara Maharaj. The Maratha Navy had been active for nearly 40 years when Kanoji Angre had succeeded to the Chief of Command. The fort in Khanderi was his operational headquarters for the last 21 years of his life. Sarkil Kanoji Angre died in 1729 and with him died the Maratha naval superiority. Kanoji boldly followed Shivaji's policy and rode the sea capturing ships without passes. He allowed the English ships to enter his ports on payment of the usual customs and was unwilling to make more concessions to the English. The Maratha navy had not yet emerged from this primitive stage. The seafarers indeed had skills for the sails, but their fighting fleets were inferior compared to the contemporary European. There was no further development in the navy and hence the Maratha navy progressed satisfactorily to a certain stage, but then any further improvements halted. In the memory of this brave warrior of the soil, the island of Khanderi is renamed to Kanoji Angre Island. Thank you. Hello, my name is Amruta Tarodekar and I am a research associate with the Maritime History Society. After the great Maratha sentinel Kanoji Angre, let's talk about Bombay's master shipbuilder Lauji Nasarwanji Wadia. The marriage treaty between the Portuguese and the British Empire in 1661 gave the ownership of the seven islands of Bombay to the British Empire. It was then leased out to the English East India Company. Surat, meanwhile, was a very important seaport on the western coast of India, where English East India Company was first established. Since all trade was done by sea, the shipping industry started to flourish. Lauji Nasarwanji was born at Siganpur near Surat in about 1700. He was trained as a shipwright and was employed in the English East India Company's dockyard at Surat, which prior to 1735 was the principal dock not only on that side of the peninsula but also of all India. Constant attacks by the Marathas led to shift of base of the company from Surat to Bombay. As Bombay grew, they realized the need of having an advanced shipbuilding center at Bombay. The company recognized the skills of Lauji Nasarwanji and invited him to Bombay. Bombay was then an emerging port town where people from various fields were invited to settle. He arrived in Bombay from Surat in May 1736 along with 10 other carpenters. He was employed to build ships for the company at the Bombay Dockyard. By 1748, he became the master shipbuilder. The Bombay Dry Dock, the first dry dock in Asia, was built by Lauji and his brother Sorabji in 1750. Bombay began to be considered a viable trading port for all ships from the west and the east. Shipbuilding took a kickstart during this period. He and his family built over 350 frigate and steamers for the company, the Royal Navy and for many private owners. These vessels were known to be of a superior quality than the ones made at England and undertook not only transcontinental journeys but also war. Bombay ships were preferred over English-made vessels by the traders due to its durability and quality of wood. It was under his craftsmanship that a ship 
HMS Minden was made on which the American national anthem was composed. On another Wadia built deck, the HMS Cornwallis, which was the first warship to have been built in Bombay, the Treaty of Nanking ceding Hong Kong to England was signed. The second oldest ship in the world, HMS Trincomalee, which even today is afloat and intact in Hurtle Pool, is yet another marvel of the Wadia's shipbuilding prowess. It was after his arrival to Bombay that the number of other docks subsequently began to be built. A number of ships began to be made and trade bloomed like never before. The city transformed from seven marshy islands to a busy port town under the British crown. The post of the master shipbuilder remained with the Wadias and his descendants till 1884, after which the Bombay dockyard was shifted from the Bombay government to the Indian government. Thus, Lauji Nasarwanji Wadia left behind a legacy of indigenous shipbuilding and craftsmanship which transformed the town of Bombay into one of the busiest ports in the world. Another icon in the shipping industry was Narottam Moraji. It was the era of pre-independence. The revolt of 1857 and many other disputes had led to a major unrest in the country and many leaders had emerged against the rule of the British Empire. Born in April 1877 at Porbandar, Narottam was the son of Morarji Gokudas, a textile king. His two tutors, Narayan Chandavarkar and Gopal Krishna Gokhale, instilled in him a high sense of patriotism. The British Empire had taken complete control over international waters that were the pride and recognition of India once upon a time. India has always been a maritime country with water on its three sides and a vast natural coastline. As years passed by under the British Empire, the English dominance increased, sidelining many Indian shipping companies. The new shipping policies further tightened the control over Indian vessels and led to the decline of Indian shipping. Inspired by the wave of national resurgence generated by Mahatma Gandhi and the Swaraj movement, Narottam Morarji and his associates embarked upon a national shipping venture and the Skindia Steam Navigation Company Limited came into existence on March 27, 1919. Thus were laid the foundations of modern Indian shipping. It was a successful attempt towards regaining India's maritime freedom and reviving India's shipping industry. On April 5, 1990, Skindia's first ship SS Loyalty sailed from Bombay to the United Kingdom and became pioneers in Indian shipping in international waters during the 20th century. The epic voyage symbolized the generation of a vanquished national industry, development of neglected ports, growth of Indian trade, prevention of drain of wealth and opening of a career at sea to the Indian youth. It was with definite patience and tenacity of purpose that the Skindias conducted the long voyage towards their goal. For 10 years, Narottam Murarji guided the destiny of the Skindia company and promoted the interests of the Indian shipping industry. The progressive growth of Indian shipping beats testimony to its vision and foresight. Narottam Murarji the architect of the modern Indian shipping passed away on November 5th, 1929, leaving behind a legacy of entrepreneurship and service towards the country and for its people. The company's first bulk carrier 
was named after the maritime hero who gave a new name and opportunities to Indians in the international waters. Thank you. Hello, I am Janvi Lukegaukar, Research Associate at the Maritime History Society. After Narottam Muradji, we have more heroes from the 20th century closer to our times. Amrita just spoke about the pioneers in modern Indian shipbuilding. We now turn to heroes from the Indian Navy. The eighth of our maritime heroes we are talking about today is Vice Admiral N. Krishnan. Here is the well-known photograph of the surrender ceremony at Dhaka in 1971. One officer in the picture stands out in the sea of khaki and olive green. He is the then flag officer commanding in chief, Eastern Naval Command of the Indian Navy, Vice Admiral Neelkanta Krishnan. If INS Vikrant played a lead role in December 1971 by blockading Pakistan in the Bay of Bengal, enabling Indian victory and the liberation of Bangladesh, its success is attributed to him. His strategy to lure Pakistan's deadly submarine PNS Ghazi to the mouth of Vishakhapatnam harbour and sink her on the first day of Pakistan's attack on India on 3rd December 1971 still ranks as one of the great naval victories and diplomacy. But this historical incident is not the only high point in the career of Vice Admiral Krishnan. His 17 decorations speak volumes of his service to the Indian Navy. Born on 8th June 1919, Krishnan was successful in the entrance examination and joined the Indian Mercantile Marine Training Ship Dufferin in 1935 and he was one among the two selected for the Royal Navy, the other being Admiral Jalkar Seji. He was formally trained in the United Kingdom and saw action in the Second World War in several theatres. Starting his military career at the age of 16, Vice Admiral Krishnan fought in pre- and post-independence battles in Europe and Asia and even in the Second World War. The battle leading to the capture of Abadan contains one of the most heroic sagas of young naval leadership in battle. Our hero was then a lieutenant. As the captain of a small tugboat, which was to act as a support to the Australian frigate HMAS Yara, with a crew of just 12 ratings, then Lieutenant Krishnan was involved in the capture of Karamshar Abadan in the Persian Gulf. His tug not only provided warning and information to the following Royal Navy attacking force, but also forced the surrender of an enemy gunboat in a battle in close quarters which saw them kill three enemy personnel and take 20 as prisoners. Krishnan was awarded a gallantry medal, the Distinguished Service Cross, for his bravery in action. He is in a select group of only two Royal Indian Navy officers who were awarded with the DSC. Many such inspiring and hair-raising accounts have been described in his autobiography, A Sailor's Story, edited and put together by his son, Mr. Arjun Krishnan. Admiral Krishnan is very well known in the Navy for his tact, diplomacy and daring do. He went through a range of operations and postings. His accomplishments speak volumes of the range of his expertise. In the later years of his distinguished service, he had also been assigned with the important postings and even helped to create a blueprint for the modern Indian Navy. In 1961, he led the winning naval push that brought down the Portuguese flag and liberated Goa. His postings gave him a practical understanding in diplomacy and developed his strategic outlook which helped him bringing reforms for the Indian Navy. Admiral Krishnan was seconded to the Ministry of Shipping and Transportation and was made the first Chairman and Managing Director of Cochin Shipyard Limited. He continued to be on active substantive service in the Navy and set up Greenfield Shipyard from scratch. 
this legacy of his is now at work constructing the country's first indigenous aircraft carrier. Admiral Krishnan not only was a part of Indian Navy's finest moment, but also contributed significantly to making it possible. After a distinguished service in the Indian Navy, Vice Admiral N. Krishnan retired in 1976. He passed away in January 1982, but leaves behind a legacy that is cherished by all in the Indian Navy. Our ninth maritime hero is Admiral Bhaskar Sadashiv Soman. He was in command of the Indian Navy from 1962 to 1966 as the fourth chief of naval staff. Even to this day, young officers look forward to emulate this role model of value-based leadership. Tracing early life of Bhaskar Soman will take us back to his humble beginnings. He was a son of a Gandhian freedom fighter. An unlikely candidate to join the Navy and to fight for the British Raj, it is to the credit of his parents that he could do so and to inculcate in their son some excellent values of life such as integrity, humility, simplicity and forthrightness and above all patriotic fervour. Admiral Soman's rise in the service was meteoric, not unusual for good officers in those early days when there were so few. He was commissioned in the Royal Navy in August 1934. He obtained his first command in July 1942 and attained a flag rank in, on 12th June 1958. His first real experience of the war was in a land-based operation. The Italians had overwhelmed the British Army detachment in a surprise raid at Berbera, a small port not far away from Aden. To prevent an Italian consolidation, the task of releasing Indian prisoners was given to HMIS Cornwallis. Petty Officer John Erksley and 20 sailors under the then Lieutenant Soman with an Italian interpreter formed the landing party. His leadership qualities combined with tact, diplomacy and skills were developed as he went along and rose in the service. Not many naval officers, even those who knew him in the service, are aware that he obtained an international pilot's license at the age of 20 in his spare time while he was under training in the United Kingdom. His integrity and forthrightness were evident when he refused to go ashore in South Africa when in command of a ship as his crew was forbidden to land due to apartheid laws. He was promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral on 12 June 1958 and reappointed as Flag Officer Commanding Bombay. In April 1960, he took over as the Flag Officer Commanding Indian Fleet and was in charge of India's naval operation during 1961 liberation of Goa. He was appointed as the second Indian Chief of Naval Staff as a Vice Admiral on 5th June 1962. He was the Chief when the 1965 war with Pakistan took place. Admiral Soman retired from the Indian Navy on 22nd November 1966, relinquishing the post of CNS as a Vice Admiral, the then highest attainable rank in the Indian Navy. In 1968, the post of CNS was up upgraded to the rank of full admiral and on 21st October 1980, Soman and R.D. Katari, his predecessor as CNS, were promoted to the honorary rank of full admiral on the retired list by President Neelam Sanjeeva Reddy. Our director, Commodore Odakal Johnson, writes in his book, Timeless Way, and I quote, there is much in our legacy that provides heroic inspiration in a ship-based service which does not naturally breed heroism. The commando-like exploits of Soman and Krishnan are correct folklore for a resurgent maritime military spirit. We salute these naval heroes. Through the times, we have seen our maritime heroes of past and present. 
and it is no coincidence that we are celebrating our maritime heroes today on 7th September the birth anniversary of one such legend of indian navy late vice admiral mp avti through today's monsoon musings we are honoring a maritime hero of the modern times and also remembering the maritime heroes of our past these are the heroes that stand testimonials to the fact that indians have not only been crossing the seas for millennia but are also making history thank you that was an interesting list of maritime heroes along with the heroes of our past today we also commemorate the birth anniversary of one such legend of indian navy late vice admiral mp avti joining us today is a sailing legend sir robin knox johnston who will share with us his reminiscences and tributes to the late admiral in 1969 sir robin became the first person to perform a solo non-stop circumnavigation of the globe along with sir peter blake he won the second jules verne trophy for which they were honored with the isaf yachtsman of the year award in 1969 sir robin established the first clipper round the world yacht race and has since worked with the clipper ventures company as chairman it is perhaps his greatest achievement to have introduced so many people to competitive sailing via their involvement in the clipper ventures in 2007 he set a record as the oldest yachtsman to complete a solo circumnavigation voyage in the velux 5 oceans race It is interesting to note that Sueli, the boat that took Sir Robin around the globe in the first solo non-stop and unassisted circumnavigation, was built in India at Bombay, Mumbai. Captain Dilip Donde, the first Indian to solo circumnavigate the globe in a sailboat, was mentored by Sir Robin. Sir Robin himself took active interest in the construction of INSV Mahade the boat that took captain donde around the world he also joined the crew in the initial trial runs it was a matter of pride for the indian navy and the nation to have participated in the golden globe race of 2018 that was conducted to commemorate the 50 years of sir robin's maiden circumnavigation around the globe which he undertook in 1969 it is an honor to have sir robin with us today i now invite commodore johnson director mhs to engage our guest speaker for the evening sir robin knox johnston in a conversation sharing his memories of the late vice admiral mp avti founder of mhs a modern legend and an inspiration to many We look forward to listen to you sir over to you uh nice to have you sir robin you are of course uh, an adopted indian from the very name of the boat that's on your t-shirt uh the one which you went around the world uh, nearly 51 years ago so welcome to uh, the special commemoration to the tribute of late vice admiral avati whom you met and uh, so welcome this evening pleasure to be with you yes. so what we have been doing is as uh, this uh, program has been we have been commemorating uh, the maritime legacy of india through some extraordinary voyages from as long as a medieval history rajendra chola to various people down the line but no story of india's maritime history ends till you don't talk about the man who would have been 93 today and uh, <laughs> so i remember when i was all of 18 i saw him on national tv with his grand beard on the ts jawahar and trying to guide the asian sailing games uh that was manohar avti so uh, 
and of course he had this great dream uh, of having an indian circumnavigate the globe and uh, that dream lived on then when you yourself did it on a indian built boat uh, and when he got dilip to do the venture uh, it really uh, set the journey going and both dilip and uh, abilash always mention that uh, the interaction they have had with you uh, and uh, admiral outi was always very grateful about the whole process and today we have eight circum navigators which is a very proud thing of great pride for us so uh, tell me your first recollection of admiral outi and some things that you heard about him, or rather you saw about him. well my first um, first became aware of man was um, he contacted me to say he was thinking of trying to send a young naval officer round the world to be the first indian to do it and could i help and i said i'd be delighted you know what um what do you want and he said well what would your advice be when i was getting ready to do a single handed race round the world this would be about 2005 2006 and i said well i think the best thing you do is send your young officer over here Because I'm getting ready to race around the world right now, and it'll be a an introduction to what's going on in solo sailing, circumnavigating particularly, and of course you'll learn an awful lot about putting a boat together for such an event. And in due course, Dilip arrived, and that was the beginning of a a strong friendship which continues to this day. I didn't meet Manor till later when I actually visited India again, and. Um, I met this wonderful character. I mean, he was larger than life. I mean, he looked an admiral. He had the beard of an admiral. He had the voice of an admiral. He was very clear on what he wanted, and made sure everyone else knew it. And he didn't really like people getting in his way. But he decided on true. something. It was going to happen. True, true. I found it utterly delightful. Um, as I say, larger than life, enormous fun, great sense of humour. and I was very fortunate because I got to know him quite well we um we visited the naval base in bombay um i went up to the uh, at pune to the uh, academy there uh, dilip and i stayed with the admiral in his house um so i saw a lot of him we went sailing on um, the boat before dilip went around the world uh, the admiral was there and later on when dilip and i were crossing india on the train we went to nagpur and the admiral met us there and we went to the tiger reserve which was very impressive so i spent a lot of time with him and the more i spent with him the more i i found him absolutely delightful and enormous fun i remember up at nagpur we we didn't see any tigers but the guy, the warden said um, oh a tiger slept here last night <laughs> and manos said i must lie where the tiger slept <laughs> and i got this wonderful photograph of him lying in the grass with the <laughs> tiger and slept but he was like that he was just great fun and you know you you tell him things and things happened uh, i remember taking dinner about to cross island in bombay harbor and i said i'd like sure. to go to cross island he said why so because there's some cannons there and they're the old armstrong uh, muzzle uh, breech loaders he said what from i said there's a battery there that old island was a battery uh, let's go and we found the cannons we were two of them Well, of course, Manuel is not going to leave them there, is he? He's going to get them recovered. He, he then traces them and finds that they were made in Calcutta. In fact, oh, he was just such fun. He was so interested. Anything to do with maritime history, and I share that interest. So, inevitably, we were going to get on very well, and we indeed we did. He he kind of when you tell me the story of the Tiger Reserve, there are a lot of stories people have told. He was not a one apple cart person. you could talk to him about sailing you could talk to him about birds you could talk to him about wild animals you could talk to him about uh, any subject and he would have a anecdote or he would have a question for you of course and he himself i remember this last year or so the year before he went for i call his final voyage he would come all dressed up with his yellow socks and his lovely hat and he said i am dressed up why don't i come on stage and speak so when you say larger <laughs> like so uh, but i'm sure you would have had a one on one talks about the uh, the 
interest in the maritime dimension, the maritime mindedness, if I call. So, what are some of the conversations you recall uh, between you, the two of you? Well, obviously, we spent a lot of time discussing the voyage before till it made it, and then subsequently discussing Abilash's voyage. Mm -hmm. um, and by the time the girls came along, I was, you know, I was in contact with them, but not so involved as I had been with the other two, mm -hmm. although I thought the girls did brilliantly. Um, it, it was, we discussed those sort of things, and then we'd, we'd get on to maritime history. Mm -hmm. And, of course, what people perhaps don't realize is, is the wonderful maritime history that, that India has. Yes. Just go south of Bombay a little way, towards Janjira. Yes. And there's an awful lot there. And of course, yes. you had that admiral who gave us Brits a very difficult time um, <laughs> about four centuries ago. Um, he was a remarkable man, actually. And Sarkhel Angri. <laughs> That's right. We discussed these things and um, because we were both interested. And it wasn't... We weren't taking sides. We were both actually totally neutral, just discussing what was this man like. Remarkable in many ways. And what he achieved was remarkable. And we were both interested in the person from the point of view of that person and indeed his impact on Indian maritime history, which is considerable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, if I were to take this conversation, if there is one way to truly commemorate the legacy of uh, Admiral Manohar Auti for the younger generation, what would you say that the best way they can take that legacy forward? I know there are more options than one, but what a couple of things that come to you. Um, there's a wonderful poem by an American uh, called The Mussons. Mm -hmm. And it goes, listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the don't-haves, then listen close to me. Anything is possible, everything can be. And my goodness, Manu Awati absolutely lived by that. He would not take no for an answer. He would just continue to press on till he achieved his objective. And there's a lesson, I think, for all young people, whether in the Navy, Army, Air Force, civilians. Never take no for an answer if you think you're right. Manu Awati didn't. And look what he achieved. So, um, uh, really want to thank you. And I just want to share with you that uh, I, I met Manohar Abdi in one of the paper presentations. And then at some stage, uh, I was asked, why don't I come and look after Maritime History Society? So I said, I'll think about it. And I receive a call from him, Johnny, when are you joining us? Now, it's very difficult to say no after that. You know, <laughs> so he won't take no, he won't let you say no. But uh, we did have a couple of, you know, places where we disagree. And he was also very graceful. I mean, he let you say, of course, he would have his very strong view. Uh, what, what are some places you all looked things differently and conversations went or the love for sea overtook everything? Oh, yes. I mean, we, when um, they first got the designs of the boat, Muddy, uh, I think I wrote three pages mm -hmm. of things I felt should be done to it. Um, actually, Manuel just accepted them. Um, I said, look, you've got to do this, you've got to do this, you've got to do this. I think it was about three pages long. Dillett may have it somewhere still. Um, but he just accepted it. Um, you know, he, he sort of said, look, well, you know, you know what you're talking about. Um, I'm going to listen. I mean, I think that was another of his great attributes, actually. He would listen. And if he thought the advice he was hearing or the suggestions he was hearing were sensible, he would adopt them. You know, he wasn't one of those people who was stuck in, stick in the mud at all. He was very open to ideas. And I think that's probably why he was such a, a fantastic leader. Mm -hmm. So, in closing, if I were to, I know you've already said a message about never say no, but if I ask specifically for a word for budding maritime enthusiasts with your legacy of sailing specifically, I know it's an expensive uh, vocation or an interest to have, 
uh, and we are doing our best to promote it. For budding maritime enthusiasts, sailors or writers or storytellers in any way, give us a closing word uh, in that same breath, not just Admiralty, say from your side. Well, yes, boating, unfortunately, can be expensive. Uh, it doesn't have to be. Uh, it tends to be people want the latest expensive toy. But the strength of British sailing is in the dinghies and the small inexpensive boat. And this is where I think India could develop. You've got the tradition. We know. I mean, I served for 14 years with Indian crews. And I know they're very good seamen. The, the Laskers we had were excellent. Um, and very loyal. And, and I like them immensely. But the tradition's there. You look at your fishermen, you look at the people who used to run the country craft up and down the coast. It's there. What you haven't yet done is open people's eyes to the fact that it's a wonderful leisure pastime. And it doesn't have to be expensive. And it's not just that, it's the social side of sailing. It isn't the big stuffy clubs which are expensive. It's what we call here the sailing clubs where people roll their sleeves up and lay a concrete slip. They'll help each other. Mm. They haven't got a lot of money. The clubhouse is probably a garden shed. Mm -hmm. But are they sailors? Yes. Um, do they develop sailing? Yes. Do they train young people? Yes. And that's where the strength of British sailing is. And I believe that's where it should grow in India. So thanks a lot. That's a good note. And I, I always say the best tribute to uh, Manohar Arti is go to the sea. Don't don't just stay on the shore. Just get to the sea in any manner. And if you can't, we add a line. At least write about it or read about it. So thank you, Sir Robin. Thank you for joining on this very uh, very momentous occasion for us. Because in India, if we talk of maritime legacy, uh, Manohar Abdi will very much be a very major voice in that. So it's great for you to join, and I'm sure he must be smiling from up there at the stuff that we have been talking about. So he great. Would, <laughs> he would turn around and say, why didn't you mention this? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and he would have a closing word for it. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for giving us a delightful insight in the life and achievements of late Vice Admiral MP Avti and for sharing your memories of the feats that put India on the sailing maps. And thank you for introducing us to such a wonderful quote. We at MHS will definitely listen and try, strive to integrate the never-haves of the maritime domain into the mainstream narratives. Thank you for joining us today. India is a land of many such kindred spirits as late Vice Admiral of T, and we take great pride in each of them. It is our duty and privilege to honor their acts of extraordinary courage. I now invite Vice Admiral Karve, patron MHS, who shall deliver the closing address for today's monsoon musings. But first, let me introduce you to him. Vice Admiral A.R. Karve was commissioned into the Indian Navy on 1st July 1980 and retired after 38 years of distinguished naval service in July 2018 as the Flag Officer Commanding-in-Chief, Southern Naval Command. In a range of operational, staff and command assignments, Admiral and Anti-Submarine Warfare Specialist had the honour to be both the comm commissioning crew of INS Virat and its commanding officer in the rank of Captain. Admiral Karvi has held prestigious positions in the flag ranks as steering Indian Naval Operations, Chief of Personnel and Chief of Staff at Western Naval Command. He has been closely associated as a paper presenter, supporter and trustee of Maritime History Society at many occasions. He is also the patron of MHS. I now invite Vice Admiral Karve to deliver the closing remarks. Over to you, sir. I am glad to be here, not to draw the program to its close, but to highlight that the saga of our maritime heroes 
is a continuous story, since the future will certainly throw up even more. These extraordinary voyages, whose spirit still lives within us, continue to inspire us as role models. This commemorative conversation is indeed a good gesture in paying a tribute to our founder and as a means to reminding fellow mariners about our maritime legacy. The day and occasion are indeed well chosen, and who better than Vice Admiral M. P. Avati, a legend and a hero of our times, to be remembered on this occasion. Let me quote from an article about Vice Admiral M. P. Avati, and I quote, operating in the extremely dangerous territory with constant danger to his ship from enemy mines and submarines, an un undeterred Avati went on a probing sortie of enemy defended harbors before finally striking a massive blow. Avati not only attacked and captured three enemy ships carrying contraband goods, but also pursued an enemy submarine. Unquote. Such is the heroism we admire and remember thanks to the initiative taken by the Maritime History Society. We salute these great maritime personalities who have inspired us with their deeds and actions. As we honor them, we, we gently nudge our young mariners to follow in the paths of these great heroes. There are even more Indian maritime heroes, and I am sure we will find another occasion to learn more about them. May we continue to produce more heroes, and even more importantly, may we continue to remember them. As we go forward, the current restrictions due to the pandemic have opened unimagined opportunities to enhance our awareness and knowledge. Maritime History Society has in the past few months brought before you a wide range of content on our maritime heritage through a variety of events, video blogs, and its website. I am certain it has kindled even more interest in our maritime past. We are hoping to bring even more formalized learning programs and independent research opportunities about India's maritime history. My congratulations to the MHS research team. You have done well. This is a fascinating journey you have embarked upon, which will inspire you to do even more. Let us close with the MHS tagline. Let heritage awaken our maritime consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for our insights. Today's evening was a good beginning in appreciating the life and times of the lesser known maritime heroes of India. Just as we need to do a lot to understand maritime history, we also need to take a fresh look at what the maritime dimension means to our concepts of heroism in India and contemplate the need to get them involved into the popular narratives. With the goal of increasing maritime awareness, MHS is proud to announce Kala Sagar 2020, an annual visual arts competition. MHS urges you to be creative and invites you to contribute with your artistic interpretations of the vast maritime domain. Do register yourself and further details are shared on the social media handles and on our website as well. Let me also tell you about our next major event that will be conducted in mid-November, the National Maritime Heritage Conclave titled Exploring the Unsung Fames in Indian Maritime History. Thank you to the friends and supporters of Maritime History Society. As we close the session, we urge you to stay connected with us through our various social networking sites. We have our presence on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also connect with us through our website, www.mhsindia.org. We hope to see you again soon. Bye.